Welcome back everyone. This week we're going to talk about pre-dynastic and early dynastic Egypt. As I mentioned previously, the standards of Egyptian art were not established until the early dynastic period, so those will not apply until the second half of this lecture. Around 50 million years ago, Egypt was completely covered with sea, which helped sculpt the ancient landscape that we know today. Pre-dynastic Egypt is very hard to determine, so let's talk about the earliest evidence we have for humans in the area of Egypt. The earliest evidence of human habitation in Egypt could be as early as 700,000 years ago. While not much has survived from that time, evidence of rock art can be found all over Egypt. Some rock art that is found in Wadi Digla depicts elephants and giraffes, both of which are currently extinct in the area of Egypt. The Neolithic Revolution took place about 12,000 years ago. This put took place mainly in the Near East. This revolution was a transition from a nomadic lifestyle to a more permanent lifestyle. A nomadic's lifestyle typically relied on hunting and gathering, while a permanent lifestyle relied on farming and the domestication of animals. This more permanent lifestyle lended itself to the development of pottery and even writing. This Neolithic revolution all led up to habitation in Egypt. Egyptologists consider the beginning of pre-dynastic Egypt to be around 5,000 to 6,000 BCE. Multiple quote-unquote cultures have been found in various locations around Egypt. Egyptologists and archaeologists have often assigned culture names to particular eras. Each culture name is usually after the place where the Egyptian settlement was found. This does not mean that these cultures developed at different speeds. In general, there was a gradual development over all different cultures. The majority of archaeological finds from pre-dynastic Egypt have been found in Upper Egypt, which, if you remember from last time, is the southern section of Egypt. We're going to be talking about four main cultures, the Badarian, the Amration, the Gerzen, and Nakata. If you notice that the Amration and Gerzen cultures are also called Nakata I and Nakata II. That's because Egyptologists have now related all three cultures together and in a chronological order. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to cover all of the different cultures from pre-dynastic Egypt, but I encourage you to learn more. Flinders Petrie is sometimes called the father of pre-dynastic Egypt. He was a British archaeologist who was the first archaeologist to systematically excavate and record Egyptian sites. He created the chronology of pre-dynastic Egypt through pottery styles that were found. He used a concept called sequence dating. Sequence dating relies on the concept that as artifacts change over time, they do so in a predictable manner. Because of this, it is now possible to date them to one another. Petrie dated the pots based on the decoration and how they were made. As you can see from this image, there are a variety of different pottery types. I'm going to mention a few as we go through each culture. The first culture we're going to talk about is the Badarian culture. This culture dates from 4500 to 4000 BCE. These people had the first evidence of agriculture in Egypt, as they farmed wheat, barley, and herbs. They also hunted animals and had domesticated animals, which provided both food and clothing material. Around 40 settlements have been found dating to this period, as well as 600 graves that have been discovered around the modern city of El Badari in Middle Egypt. The people of this culture made jewelry out of copper, ivory, and quartz, and may have even traded for turquoise from the Sinai Peninsula. The pottery that was standard for this period was called blacktop ware. As the name suggests, these were simple pots with black slip along the top. Their burials were quite simple. These bodies were buried with reed mats or animal skins and placed with personal items, such as shells or stone beads. These bodies were not typically mummified, unless it was done naturally by the environment. This pot burial that's located in the Petrie Museum in London is an extremely unique case of a woman being buried in a large ceramic pot. The people from this culture have also carved ivory figurines, as you can see on the left. The Amration culture is next, although it is now called Nakata I. It was originally called Amration because it was focused in the city of El Amra, and it is now considered part one of the Nakata culture. This period went from 3,900 to 3,650 BCE. During this period, cross-line pottery began to be produced. This is a typically white or red pottery with either white or red designs in a geometric pattern. 
The Amrishian people constructed rowboats out of papyrus, and thus there was trade between Upper and Lower Egypt. Evidence of gold has also been found, which indicates there must have been trade between Nubia, where most gold was produced. These people lived in mud brick buildings, which was an improvement from the huts from previous eras. There is also some evidence of animal deities and people wearing amulets to depict them. One of the most interesting artifacts that began to emerge were cosmetic palettes. These are large siltstone discs that are often rectangular in shape and later take the shapes of different animals. The reason they're called cosmetic palettes is because Egyptians used these to grind different materials to make makeup. Next is the Gersian culture, which we also call Nakata too. Gersia is a settlement north of El Badari and El Amra. This culture was from 3500 to 3200 BCE. This is where the decoration on pottery became much more advanced. They suddenly moved from geometric patterns, from white cross-line pottery, to decorative schemes in decorated pottery. The decorated ware shows different scenes, including humans, ostriches, and reed boats. There was a continuation of trade from Mesopotamia and Asia Minor. Cylinder seals from Mesopotamia have been found in Egypt. Lapis lazuli beads also show a possible trade route to modern Afghanistan. At this time, burials were simple pit burials. One of the most famous burials is a man that has been dubbed Ginger because of his red hair. He was buried in a shallow pit grave near Gabellan and is currently reconstructed in a grave in the British Museum. The interesting thing is that this body is naturally mummified. The dry climate in Egypt makes it entirely possible for bodies to be naturally mummified over a period of time. This may be why later Egyptians chose to mummify their bodies to preserve them. In the city of Hierakompolis, there is the oldest known painted tomb, which is known as Hierakompolis Tomb 100. You can see in this image a reconstruction of one of the murals, which has a variety of boats, donkeys, ibexes, ostriches, lionesses, gazelle, cattle, and even human beings. This is also has some of the earliest examples of two important motifs in Egyptian art. The first being the master of animals motif. This is a motif that we will see frequently throughout this course. It shows one person holding up two upright animals on either side of them. This is an example of the belief of order over chaos. The master is controlling and maybe even taming the two animals. This mural also has an evidence of the smiting motif. This motif typically shows a pharaoh smiting an enemy. They might be holding the hair of the enemy while wielding a mace or an axe. Later on in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the most famous example of this motif. The Nakata III culture is the final culture of pre-dynastic Egypt. It is mainly located in the city of Nakata and dates from 3200 to 3000 BCE. During this period, a governmental state was beginning to form, which is sometimes why Egyptologists call this Dynasty Zero, as this is the beginning of Egypt as a unified state. This period had a lot of firsts. The Egyptian language began around this time, although in a very simplified form. Cosmetic palettes were decorated with graphical narratives. And there were the first examples of irrigation and sailing on the Nile. Early writing was found on ivory tags that labeled large storage vessels. These were found in tomb UJ at Abydos, which has been dubbed the tomb of the Scorpion King. The tags were an early form of hieroglyphics that designated which estate the storage vessels came from. The cosmetic palettes that became extremely popular all focus on the concept of order over chaos, especially in regards to the human world versus the animal world. The most famous palette of these is the Narmer palette. This was found in a deposit in the Temple of Horus at Neken, and it has multiple different interpretations. On one side, it shows an extremely large smiting motif, with the king smiting an enemy with a mace. On the other side, there are three registers. The first register depicts a king in a procession in front of beheaded bodies. The second depicts two snake-like creatures leashed by men and the third depicts a bull attacking a city. The king on either side is labeled with the hieroglyphics of a catfish and a chisel, which phonetically spells out nar mer. This has been always interpreted as the name of the king. The king is wearing two different crowns on either side of the palette, both of which have been identified as the crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt. Because of this, the palette has generally been interpreted as the unification of Egypt under Pharaoh Narmer.
As we talked about in the previous lecture, the Egyptian art canon was developed during this last period of the pre-dynastic era. The Narmer palette is the object that many art historians have pinpointed the beginnings of many of the Egyptian art rules that were used for centuries. Hierarchical scale is evident, with Narmer being the most important figure on both sides of the palette. There is also the separation of registers and even half registers, with each character equally spaced apart and fixed to the ground line. Although the interpretation of this palette is always being questioned, there is no question that this piece is key in the development of the Egyptian art canon. The early dynastic period is a grouping that was created from the first two dynasties. This period goes from around 3100 to 2686 BCE. Narmer is believed to be the first king of a unified Egypt and was the first king of the first dynasty. To express unity of both parts of Egypt, there were royal cemeteries in both Saqqara in the north and Abydos in the south, although the bodies of the kings were only buried in Abydos. These tombs were often a series of rooms that may have represented the layout of a palace, implying that this was a palace made for the king in the afterlife. During this period, pharaohs were known for their serek, which is a type of crest that held the king's name. It was often a rectangle with the king's name inside and a falcon bird standing on top. The rectangle was thought to represent a palace facade and the falcon was to represent the god Horus. This form was later converted into a cartouche, which was an oval with a line on one side that always held the name of a pharaoh. Another famous king was King Den, who was the first king to be depicted wearing the double crown of Egypt. The double crown was a combination of the crown of Lower Egypt, which was the red crown, and the crown of Upper Egypt, which was the white crown. The wearing of both crowns was extremely significant as it indicated that the pharaoh had control over both parts of Egypt. Interestingly, neither crown has ever been found archaeologically, so it is not even known how they were made. Many archaeologists presume that they might have been woven and painted, which would have made them very fragile and may have not been preserved. Others have speculated that these crowns were passed from ruler to ruler, which means that there was only a couple in existence at the same time. Many of the rulers of the Second Dynasty are not very well known. The final king of the Second Dynasty, called Kasa Kemwi, is mostly well known because of two statues of himself. During his reign, he most likely had several successful military campaigns and multiple building projects in El Cobb, Hierocompolis, and Abydos. He was also quite unique in that his serek had both a falcon, depicting the god Horus, and an unknown animal depicting the god Seth. Horus and Seth were nephew and uncle in Egyptian mythology, and Horus defeated Seth after his uncle murdered his father, Osiris. Kasakemwi had two identical statues of himself, one in a light stone and the other in a dark stone. These statues may match up with the duality of Horus and Seth, who often represent the concept of order over chaos. The tight robe that Kasakemwi is wearing in both statues may be related to a Hebset ceremony, which we'll talk about next week. The lightstone statue also has a battle scene on one side, with the number 47,209 next to it. This possibly alludes to the number of those killed in one of his most famous battles. Kasakemwi had one son named Djoser, who buried his father in Saqqara. Next week, we are going to start with Djoser, who was the first king of the Old Kingdom. Thanks for watching, and stay safe!